Fallout Tactics is an isometric, squad-based tactical game developed by Microforte and published by Interplay's 14 Degree East Division. The series' first spin-off title was a complete departure from Fault 1 and 2 in terms of tone and gameplay, featuring a unique blend of turn-based slash real-time combat that drew inspiration from games like Jagged Alliance 2 and XCOM. Even before the game's release in March of 2001, the developers began work on its Doom sequel. This is the development and demise of Fault Tactics 2. In an interview, lead designer of Fault Tactics, Ed Orman, recounted how much work had been completed on the sequel. I don't know if there were plans officially, but if I recall correctly, we, Microforte, had documents outlining an entire new campaign, a new enemy type. I think it was producer Tony Oakton that came up with an awesome idea for a baddie, a description of the opening cutscene, possibly even staffing plans. It was reasonably advanced before I resigned. Images of the enemy he's referencing were never released, but one piece of leaked concept art depicts a mutated crocodile. This was a great creature concept that would eventually make its way into the Fault universe when the Gator Claw was introduced in one of Fault Force DLCs. The late great concept artist Tariq Rahim, who made most of Tactics concept art, drew two additional pieces as well. Tantalizingly, this image shows them in a more humanoid form and even wearing clothes, suggesting they had acquired some degree of intelligence. I've heard speculation that the game would have taken place in post-apocalyptic Florida, but I've never been able to confirm this rumor, even after asking several of the developers. I think this speculation arose because crocodiles in the US are typically only found there. During my interview with Ed Orman, I also asked him about tactics too. I remember that Tony Oakton came up with a terrific new big bad for the sequel, based on mutated intelligent plants. I really liked that idea, and the way that we were going to build them up over the course of another campaign. The crocodile was probably because we were pushing towards swamps as a new environment. I think we planned the campaign to be shorter and more focused, definitely heavier on the tactics, less on the story, although it would still be the backbone of the campaign. Pretty sure we would have ditched random encounters. The mention of no random encounters is particularly interesting, as random encounters on the world map were easily one of the worst aspects of the first game. Gareth Davies, who worked as both an artist and a level designer during Fallout Tactics development, detailed the campaign's premise even further in a forum post. The basic premise was that a Gek had been irradiated, and so the Garden of Eden it created was full of mutant plants and fungi. Day of the Triffids, Doctor Who, and the Seeds of Doom, probably my favorite episode, and the good old sci-fi standard of radiation equals giant monsters were the big influences. My favorite aspect of the theme was the idea that you essentially have nature doing its thing and rapidly rejuvenating the desert waste, but those wacky humans feel the need to oppose it because they don't like the idea of becoming fertilizer. There was a lot of moral ambiguity to explore, so all in all, I think it was a pretty strong setting slash narrative behind the game, especially compared to the first with its robots. Tactics was the first game in the series to not offer player dialogue options, and Gareth Davies even revealed one of the team's ideas for a random encounter related to this. My biggest regret about Fallout Tactics 2 getting canned was the fact we didn't get to unleash the dialogue tree secret encounter upon the world. Quote, You see the dialogue tree. Its brown, shriveled form obviously hasn't gotten the attention it deserves, but with love and care it would certainly live to bear sweet fruit once more. One of the main issues fans had with Tactics was its discontinuity of the established canon, but it's worth mentioning that the majority of the development team weren't familiar with the Fallout series. With additional knowledge of the franchise and being open to the criticisms of the first game, Microforte was poised to make what could have been a great sequel. 
In another post, Gareth Davies spoke on this point, stating, One of the biggest resources I drew upon when working in a more significant role on the ill-fated Fallout Tactics 2 was varied treatises and comments from Fallout fans on what they felt constituted the Fallout universe. I was also lucky enough to have the original docs for Fallout on hand, and so between the original vision and a collective perception of that vision once realized, it painted a pretty clear picture. Likewise, criticisms of the tactics game world were taken on board and mentally collated. Plus, we were very conscious of heating Fallout canon as best we could, and providing more interesting tactical missions, rather than the run-and-gun focus of the first game. However, during my interview with level designer Ivan Burem, I asked him about Tactics 2, and his response made it sound like the sequel might have just been more of the same. I gotta say I don't remember much other than recalling it was pitched in the wrong direction. Essentially on clarifying the direction of Fallout Tactics, elements of the team wanted to clarify it further and just make it a squad-based tactics game essentially dumping all RPG elements and just making it a bunch of missions you get and go off to complete in linear fashion. In my opinion, it would have been Fallout only in name and was not what Tactics 2 should have been. I do recall making a pitch to the team on what I thought Tactics 2 should be and that Fallout Tactics needed to keep RPG aspects, it just needed to focus on those that worked with the tactical gameplay. But it was clear what direction it was heading in and what would end up being pitched to the publishers. And from my perspective at the time, I did not see the publisher wanting to proceed with it and were simply stating that they were interested until Fallout Tactics was finally completed. The fact that it did not go forward and all pretense dropped after Fallout Tactics shipped was no surprise to me and shouldn't have been to the rest of the team. However of note was that we were internally working on a 3D engine that was a possibility for Fallout Tactics 2. So if there was a Fallout Tactics 2, it could have been 3D, making use of many of the Fallout Tactics assets as the sprites had all been rendered from 3D models, though needing to be converted to low-poly variants. Alternatively, I also recall that since each tile in the game was rendered from four angles, that we would instead implement it so the game could be rotated so as to be viewed from four directions with the possibility of polygonal characters. Originally for Fallout Tactics, the team considered having polygonal characters for Fallout Tactics instead of using sprites, so this seemed a logical direction for the existing engine and team to go in. Intrigued by the possibility of a 3D engine, I also ask Ed Orman about it. The 3D engine was indeed in the works. I believe programmer Peter Wake was pushing for something like it even during Tactics development. One obstacle was our production pipeline wasn't set up for low poly, but the end result looked terrific and let us make use of some graphics acceleration and lighting that we couldn't do with sprites. My memory is fuzzy, but I do think if we could have secured funding, it would have been a good direction to go in. I wish there was footage of it. Prior to the release of the first game, producer Tony Oakton also spoke about a potential sequel. For an expansion, I would want to see some new armor, maybe combat armor, new weapons, some new tile sets, and some new multiplayer games. Plus, of course, an entirely new story with new enemies for the Brotherhood of Steel to fight. If we did Tactics 2, then I think we would want to make some major changes, and we would have to think seriously about moving away from pre-rendered tiles and sprites. In synopsis, Tactics sequel might have taken place somewhere in the swamps of the southeastern United States, a setting that has yet to appear in the series and could have been a great environment. The campaign would have featured a corrupted Gek that was spawning intelligent plants who were threatening to destroy humanity and would have acted as the Brotherhood's main antagonist. The Day of the Trifids is easily one of the best post-apocalyptic novels I've read, and with it serving as one of the campaign's main inspirations, it likely would have had a much stronger story as well. The use of a 3D engine would have made it the first 3D fault entry and guaranteed vastly improved graphics, which could have been incredible considering the first installment already looked much better than Fault 1 and 2. 
We also would have seen lesser enemies like mutated crocodiles, and perhaps even the return of other factions from the first game, like the Beast Lords, Robots, Reavers, and Raiders. Despite the issues Fallout Tactics had, it was a genuinely good game given the circumstances around its creation, and the development team was optimistic in the weeks leading up to its release. However, the development team didn't even have time to celebrate Tactics' launch. The relationship between 14 Degrees East slash Interplay and Microforte was strained during development, as it took Microforte three months longer than contracted to finish the game. Though it's worth noting they were given a completely unrealistic timetable. An inexperienced and relatively small team had to create a massive single-player campaign and multiplayer modes in a new engine in only 15 months. Even further, Interplay was going to provide art assets from the first two games, but due to an internal issue they couldn't, and Microforte were forced to recreate all of these assets themselves. Despite receiving mostly positive reviews, it also sold less than expected, an issue that could be blamed on Interplay's marketing, but regardless, that was the final nail in the coffin. Originally, there was interest from Interplay in producing an expansion pack to the first game or a sequel, but their financial struggles would cause them to cut ties with Tactics developers. Facing their own money troubles, Microforte would subsequently lay off nearly all of Tactics' team. During my interview with Ivan Biram, I also asked him about the layoffs. Well, I don't think these things are ever well handled, and I think many on the team were inexperienced and naive, without trying to make them out as being in the wrong here. But we had just worked on a high-profile title of a complexity that not many had worked on in Australia. It was also fairly well received slash rated. I think they just thought that their jobs were secure, and that no way was the publisher going to not do a Fallout Tactics 2. And even if they don't, why would Microforte lay them off? Having just completed a game for an established license, and another in Sydney working on an original IP MMORPG, with innovative server technology called Big World that the company was betting on as being their future. There were layoffs at both studios, however the majority were at Canberra. Personally, it came as a little surprise to me. Not saying it was not a difficult time for me, but I realized that Fallout Tactics 2 was not going forward months prior when I heard the direction for the game. There were a lot of other factors related to things I had heard regarding our relationship with the publisher, but the planned direction and pitch for the sequel for me was kind of the nail in the coffin. I actually posted a message to the entire team informing them that once the project was over with, they would be out of a job and should start looking for one now, which basically made me very unpopular with the entire team, not just my bosses. I guess if anything, I think that things could have been handled with a bit more honesty, as many on the team were not expecting to be out of a job after having successfully shipped a high-profile title. Again, there was a degree of naivety of what to expect, as for many this was their first job in the industry. It may not have changed their situation at all in the end, but at least it would have been less of a shock to them, as many felt betrayed. These layoffs happened not long after the game went gold on March 13th, 2001, which was notably two days before Tactics actually released on March 15th. As Ivan mentioned, Microforte put all of their efforts into the Big World project, never published another notable title, and fell into obscurity. Surprisingly, this sad story doesn't end there, though. In 1995, Interplay bought Shiny Entertainment, a development studio in California well known for titles like Earthworm Gem and MDK. After the release of Tactics, some team members were moved from 14 Degrees East to Shiny Entertainment, and one of those developers was Dan Levin. Dan Levin worked as both a designer and writer on Fallout Tactics, and at some point in 2001, he made his own pitch for a sequel. During my interview with him, I asked him about it. At one point, I moved from Interplay's 14 Degrees East to Shiny, also owned at the time by Interplay. Shiny was working on a Matrix title, and my little team was trying to get the green light on a few game ideas. We didn't succeed, and Shiny was sold with my team being disbanded. 
One of my team's ideas was continuing Fallout tactics from the Barnaki ending, where his brain gets put inside the calculator. The Brotherhood does great from then on, but a lot is at the expense of ghouls and super mutants, who are put into forced labor and internment camps. Our opening cutscene was an embedded camera crew with Brotherhood forces, who were crushing a base of renegade super mutants and ghouls, resistance movement known as the MLA, Mutant Liberation Army. They find the nursery filled with young mutants and ghouls. You see a hand cover the camera lens as they are ordered to point the cameras down, followed by the whirl of many guns and other weapons. So this time, the pretty fascist Brotherhood of Steel is the enemy. To put this pitch into context, we have to look back at the ending of the first game. The final section of the campaign revolves around the calculator, a supercomputer that uses human brains for processing power. The calculator controls a massive army of deadly robots, and its incomplete programming is causing it to commit genocide against every living thing in the wasteland. At the conclusion of the story, the player comes face to face with the calculator and is given three potential options that lead to four possible outcomes. The first option is a neutral ending where you destroy the calculator, which saves humanity from being annihilated, but in the process you also destroy some of the most advanced technology ever created, which could have been used for mankind's benefit. You can also enter the brain removing mechanism, sacrificing yourself to add your brain to the calculator, which triggers one of two endings depending on your reputation. Regardless of reputation, the calculator uses its knowledge and resources to rescue the human race from the brink of oblivion, and the wasteland becomes a relative paradise. Finally, there's an evil ending that can be achieved if the player manages to save General Barnaki, one of the leaders of the Brotherhood's Eastern Chapter. If you saved him earlier in the campaign, you can convince General Barnaki to sacrifice himself and add his brain to the calculator. During this ending, the calculator is influenced by Barnaki's xenophobia of mutation, and it uses the Brotherhood and its robots to ruthlessly hunt down super mutants and other mutated beings. The mutants who surrender are placed in labor camps, while those who run or fight back are exterminated. In response, the surviving mutants and some humans join together to form the Mutant Liberation Army, a faction that uses guerrilla warfare to challenge the Brotherhood's overwhelming power, in hopes of liberating their mutated brethren from bondage. However, the Brotherhood's overwhelming force is driving them west towards the original Brotherhood of Steel, which would result in certain doom for the MLA. This is the ending that Shiny Entertainment sequel would have considered canon, and it could have been an awesome premise for a campaign where the player joins up with the MLA to fight an evil Brotherhood of Steel. Micro Forte's mutated plant pitch still appeals to me more personally, but this could have been a really cool story regardless, with interesting themes to explore. This second attempt at a sequel also had the potential to be something special, but in 2002, Interplay sold Shiny Entertainment to Atari, putting an end to the spin-off series once and for all. To this point, Tactics remains as the last isometric turn-based game in the series, and considering the direction Bethesda has taken the IP, we'll likely never see another official entry in this vein. Both of Tactics sequels could have improved upon the faults of the first game, and culminated in an amazing tactical RPG experience. Despite multiple attempts, Fault Tactics 2 would never see the light of day, and ultimately, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.